host Duarte Swerdlow. And this is Janet Diane Moria Swerdlow. From Expansions.com and today we'd like to talk to you about our recent trip to Central America, which was quite an experience. Uh, we started out, believe it or not, in order to get there from the Great Lakes area, we had to transfer in Dallas. I hadn't been to Dallas in quite a number of years, and so I didn't know what to expect at the airport. It's been a long time, but I have to really say the Dallas-Fort Worth airport is very, very modernized. It's easy to get around, even though it's huge. They do have a train system that goes through all the terminals very quickly. Every two minutes it arrives, and it was very simple to get around everywhere. So I, I give my uh, kudos to the Dallas-Fort Worth uh, airport. Of course, we did have to go through the full body scan x-rays. Yes, which there was no choice. And since we were in a tremendous hurry, we could not wait uh, to get the uh, personal uh, search. So uh, and we were hoping for that, but there just wasn't enough. Yeah, I, I kind of like to go through it several times each time <laughs> I go. But I did put myself, and I told everyone to put themselves in the deep violet, brown merger. You know, and it really, I, when, it, when we went through it, I didn't feel any effects from it. And in fact, uh, it actually took them a little bit longer to register mm -hmm. me because of what I did in the violet. But, they let me through anyway. And hold your breath. And you hold your breath. So don't you don't breathe in, yeah, you don't breathe don't in, the, breathe in the radiation. But if you can't avoid it, you should avoid it. Anyway, so then we went from Dallas directly to San Salvador, El Salvador. And of course, the name El Salvador means the Savior. And San Salvador, the capital, means the Holy Savior. So it's a very interesting energy for that area. There are uh, seven countries in Central America. Um, and we learned quite a lot about it. El Salvador, as you know, for 20 years was involved in a terrible civil war between the, um, the very strong uh, families that owned the government, uh, kind of right wing, and opposed to the, uh, the people who were against the government. They were very left wing and supported by the communist parties in the, so at the time Soviet Union and even in Nicaragua. And so they're now starting to come out of that devastation, even though it ended about 20 years ago. Um, but still, uh, it's a, a poor country, um, and it's going to take a bit of time to really develop it to where it should be. Despite being so tiny, El Salvador has the highest population density uh, of any of the Central American countries. There are over 6 million people in El Salvador, and the capital itself has just over four million. So the traffic is quite horrendous uh, in San Salvador. And uh, in the city itself, there really isn't that much to see. It is inland. It's surrounded by volcanoes. Some of them are extinct. Some of them are not extinct. And what we found out interesting is that if you look at this little coastline uh, off of El Salvador, you can see it's very, very tiny. It's not that much. Uh, in fact, it's maybe as long as Long Island, that, that's how big it is. But off that coastline, German scientists have found 87 volcanoes just off the coast of Little El Salvador. And on the main part, on the land of El Salvador, there are 25 volcanoes, five of which are active, and a couple of which could go off really at any time. So that was very interesting, and, and while we were there, there was a 5.8 earthquake, in fact, the day after we arrived, and uh, several people in Guatemala were killed. Um, and uh, apparently that morning there were five or six earthquakes, one after the other, but we only felt uh, the large one of 5.8. From uh, El Salvador, we drove north, northwest, well, actually, from this map, it's kind of north, directly north, to the border of Guatemala. Now, when you cross borders in Central America, it's not like in the EU, um, where you can just basically drive across. You have to stop at the country you're in, get that taken care of, then drive a few meters over to the next border and take care of that. So you're really going through two borders every time you go past the border. And uh, the amazing amount of trucks that are stopped along those narrow roads. I mean, how many trucks would you say we would pass? There are hundreds, but the interesting thing is there is no rail system. There's no rail so system. So even in this short distance across, from basically the Atlantic side to the Pacific side, they all has to come by truck on very, very narrow... Mm. Uh, very bad roads. 
There are moon craters on those roads, let me tell you. Sometimes you have to go off the road to get around the road to get back to the other side. That's how bad the holes are um, in the roads there. And El Salvador has the best roads in Central America. So you can imagine what it's like in the other countries. Guatemala was absolutely horrifying, I would say. Uh, sometimes it was just mud. Well, the gravel. trucks didn't even have a bridge to cross. The yeah. bridge, the, the well, trucks. That was yeah, the, the trucks would just go across the riverbed, but it had rained the night it before. Washed away the bridge. That was in Honduras. When we finally got through Guatemala, we went into Honduras and we went to the city of Copan, which is a Mayan ruin. There must have been three, four hundred trucks lined up uh, along the little tiny narrow roads that we could hardly get through because the bridge had been washed out and the river was high, so they had to wait till the river went down and then they were going to drive across the river. And these truck drivers had been there for days and they looked like they had been there for days and some of them were sleeping in hammocks underneath their trucks. Because they had to stay with their cargo, of course. Yeah. And the borders are very heavily patrolled. Very, yes, and they're corrupt, many of them. Luckily, we were fortunate to have a guy who was ex-military uh, and also had worked for CNN on the Pan American Highway, and he knew pretty much all of the border guards in the countries. So he would say to us, you know, give me your passports, you stay here in the car, I'll go take care of it. And he did. He said if we had gone ourselves and given the passports, they would have charged us huge amounts of money just to get through each of the borders. But because they knew him and, uh, and they trusted him, he, we got through pretty much, I think one border cost us three dollars, another one cost 12 bucks. Whereas it would have been maybe 10 times that if we had gone They're ourselves. Very, very, very poor and you can certainly understand why they do what they do. It, it's, it was a, an extremely educational trip to look at these people, but the thing that impressed me the most about all of them is they still worked. They didn't give up. Yeah. You saw people out there creating jobs for themselves, whether it was stopping traffic, helping right. people buy, uh, working in their field, making their food. Mm -hmm. They were not a lazy people. They created their jobs if they didn't have one. And we saw one guy at a road stop in El Salvador dressed as a clown, and he became the traffic light because there was no traffic light at that intersection. So he had no work, so he dressed as a clown every day and he had a little sign and he would go and stop and direct traffic and people would give him tips for that. And that was his job. No matter what uh, we saw, people had something to do. They'd make pupusa and sell it, they would uh, be fruit. tour guides, fruit, whatever they could do, they became productive and I think that is an inspiration to people in the United States and other countries where unemployment is so high and there are no jobs, theoretically, you can make your own job. I mean, let's look at these people who have nothing and who've created something out of nothing. That's a, a big inspiration and it really said something to me and to my children when they saw all of that. Uh, so in Honduras, uh, we examined the ruins. Quite frankly, I was not impressed with those uh, Mayan ruins. Uh, there was a very bad energy there. It felt like the people who lived in that uh, city, which I think he said at one time had 40,000 people mm -hmm. in Mayan times, um, they were very unhappy and they didn't like uh, where they were. Well, you could feel the oppressive energy, so it was interesting to go and take a look at the, these huge ruins and to understand what used to be there and to feel how deep that energy went. Because we want to remember, as I wrote about in one of my free e-newsletters, that Central America really is a bridge between the Americas. So this is very interdimensional energy that exists here, and this is why it was used for the type of rituals. And again, you can use for positive or negative. What we felt and experienced at Copan was definitely negative. Yes. And so it was unsettling. In fact, Stuart and I, the whole way there, we didn't know, none of us said anything, including other members of our party, but as we were traveling, the closer we got, we got agitated and we got uncomfortable and we got like wanting to look over our shoulders. The minute we were in the car, we turned around the other way uh, and it was like all of us breathed the collective sigh. <sighs> and we, we said going home, we didn't feel bad. We didn't feel anything. You know, it was like it was a beautiful country. It was a lovely day. Well, actually, it turned out to be a horrible rain uh, as we got, went back into Guatemala and there was a lot of torrential downpours and then we found after we got back to El Salvador we found out that about 13 people had died in landslides in Guatemala uh, as we were driving through there. 
So this, this area, you know, landslides, earthquakes, volcanic eruptions, revolutions, uh, banditos, drug smugglers, there's like everything there that could disturb life and make people uh, miserable. And yet uh, they, they go on and they circumvent and surpass that. Um, and uh, we, the guide that we were with is uh, his grandfather's 100% Mayan. And uh, he, uh, this guide also spoke four Mayan dialects. And he told us a lot about the Mayan calendar, which I'm kind of learning some of that now. Uh, Mayan calendar, and he confirmed everything I have been telling you about the Mayan calendar. Which we'll discuss in, in the conference in October. Uh, we will be discussing what we learned about the Mayan calendar and what it really is saying. And the interesting thing as well about this particular guy was when he was 15 years old, he was conscripted by U.S. forces. Well, he was taken. That's what conscripted means. Yeah, well, sounds too nice. <laughs> Into the U.S. forces. He was taken and he was made a weapon specialist by uh, units from Mississippi and Tennessee. So he says that he spoke his American English with a Southern accent, but he really spoke very good American yeah. English. And um, he was held until he was 19 when the war was over. And he said he, out of 35 people in his unit, only four survived. And so you can imagine a 15 year old being taken from his or her family and made to do these terrible things. Um, that's really, amazing that he still has the work ethic and I said to Stuart he has every right to hate us as Americans because it was our government that did this to him and he lost two brothers he lost two brothers mm -hmm. his father was also conscripted his grandfather was conscripted they had no choice he said but to be a part because in those days you were taken by one side or the other you, you know you didn't have a choice whoever came to your village that's who took you and so fortunately or unfortunately whoever will look at it the American side you know, people think it was the El Salvador government versus the rebels. No, it was not. It was the Americans versus the communists. And they were using El Salvador as the uh, chess map or the, or, the, or the checkerboard, if you will, to, to play out their game of, of war at the expense of the people there. Yeah. Uh, and interestingly enough, the currency of El Salvador is the U.S. dollar. And the same in Honduras, and the same in Costa Rica, and the same in Panama. Isn't that interesting? You know, Hillary Clinton said that not only should the North American Union include Canada, U.S., and Mexico, she said she wanted to include Central America. And well, they already have our currency, so the assimilation is uh, pretty complete. And when you go to El Salvador, they have American-style malls, the cars are from the United States, um, a ton of fast food restaurants, every fast everything. food restaurant that's here, and even beyond, Tony Roma's, mm -hmm. which is a, you know, more of a middle class type of a restaurant, mm -hmm. those type of restaurants are there. So they're, they're bringing them in, they're bringing the people mm -hmm. in gradually into our system. You know, it's kind of like being in a Latin neighborhood in LA, or, or in Texas, or someplace like that. It's kind of just like that. And uh, the, uh, the hotels were very uh, Americanized, and they spoke, each one spoke English. So uh, from there, we also went to the, the coastline of Nicaragua. That was, that was a little scary because you know, Nicaragua still is under um, a government that supports uh, the Contra rebels and things like this. And, um, and, uh, and that coastline area between El, uh, El Salvador and Nicaragua, they still smuggle drugs, weapons, and people. You know, people that are being smuggled even from South America all the way up through here into Mexico. And when we were even at the border, there was a sign in Spanish that said, if you feel like you are being uh, abused or trafficked as a person, you know, to inform the authorities. Well, and they said on there, this is what can happen, because you have to remember these are very, very poor people. And their education for some of them, of course, is not worldly. So if they get in the back of a truck, they think they're going to be arriving in the USA, where oftentimes these people are left to die in heated containers, they have no food, they have nothing to do with their waste, I mean, it, they're dehydrated, it's terrible. They don't understand what they're getting themselves into. So at every border that we cross, they had these signs to say, this is what could happen, if this is what's going on with you, you know, be aware of what your situation is. It's really horrendous. Yeah, yeah. so it was quite uh, an experience uh, to be in Central America. You know, but a few years ago, when we were in Panama, Costa Rica, 
and even in Belize, we did not have that experience. Those countries seem to be more passive, more, um, I don't know, uh, calm in some way, especially Belize and especially uh, Costa Rica. Um, and the other funny thing or interesting thing was that the, uh, the people in El Salvador and Guatemala and others, they, they have a separate feeling about those other countries. They are not so thrilled with Costa Rica or Panama because they think those people, what do they call it? The, uh, you know, the one is called the Switzerland of Central America. The one is called the San Francisco. And the one is called the San Francisco because everything is allowed there that they, they can do. And there's a resentment about Belize because Belize used to be part of Guatemala. And when the British were in control of this area, they told the Guatemalans that they were going to build a road uh, from uh, one of the mining areas to the coastline to make it easier. But then what they did was they separated the province from Guatemala and they called it British Honduras. And they took, what, they took what they wanted, which they were supposed to take what they wanted in exchange for building the road. And of course the road never got built. Yes, and so, and then Guatemala lost the uh, huge chunk of its territory, which became uh, Belize, an independent country, a couple of decades ago. Um, and, and Belize is a very nice country, beautiful beaches and, and very nice people, but it uh, theoretically should have been part of Guatemala. Um, and so, um, there was even a movement at one time to create the Republic of Central America that would include all these countries as provinces in one government. And um, I asked the guide about that now and he said he didn't think it would be possible anymore because there's still so many uh, differences and animosities. Um, you know, there was a time when El Salvador was at war with Guatemala, was at war with Honduras, uh, and uh, of course uh, Panama was once part of Colombia, and the U.S. broke it away so that they could build the Panama Canal. Uh, of course, now the Chinese own uh, the Panama Canal. One curious thing is, and I, I mentioned this in my other podcast, I think most of the countries in Africa um, and Asia and even South America that we've been to recently, a lot of Chinese there, businessmen, uh, government officials, pouring money into those countries, uh, trying to develop them and also take the resources. But I did not see that in uh, these countries, actually. Yes, they are in Panama and yes, they're in Costa Rica, but I did not see them in the rest of Central America. So that tells me there's a more of a heavier American influence that's keeping them away. But the Americans really, from what I can see, are not doing very much to help the people of Central America, at least to create a better infrastructure, which they desperately need. We did not see black people there. Yes. And Russians, they said, were not allowed. Russians were allowed in El Salvador, but nowhere else, because they remembered that the Russians uh, uh, during Soviet Union days, uh, funded the rebels, and so they don't like Russian people in many of those countries. Um, but uh, El Salvador, I think, uh, has great potential. The food is wonderful, the scenery is really wonderful, the people really are, are nice and, and kind. And uh, hardworking. And very hardworking. Um, and so I think there's a, a tremendous potential in Central America uh, to help uh, with the rest of the world if they're given a chance. So and we had a really, a, it was a fascinating trip. You know, you never really know what you're going to get when you go overseas. And of course, we really didn't exactly know. Um, we had a clues what we were looking for, but we found it to be extremely educational. We learned a lot. We'll be sharing more deeper facts and figures with you and exercises and ways to utilize the energies that we tapped into in Central America in our October conference. So we're looking yes. forward to sharing that information on a deeper level with those of you who are attending. And after our conference, we have a very exciting adventure oh, yes. coming up. Mm. Why don't you... Well, this is going to be in the Eastern Caribbean, the first uh, 13 days of November. And we're calling it the... Cruising Atlantis. Cruising Atlantis. And of course, what does that mean, Cruising Atlantis? Well. Uh, we're going to go to the area in this Eastern Caribbean part where the tectonic plate of Atlantis is rising up. And we're going to tap into that, see what that energy is, how it is affecting the land now, what is it going to do in the future, 
and uh, how can we use that individually and globally. And we're going to be tapping into our own connections to Atlantis. So because it's a very ancient civilization, because it was very well populated, most likely you have a lifeline or many lifelines in Atlantis area. Um, we do also have the on-world simultaneous existences if you're not able to attend this particular journey with us. We also have off-world simultaneous existence scans, which are also fascinating. But if you're able to make this journey and you're interested in stepping out of your box and you're interested in opening up your genetics and you're interested in moving forward in your own interdimensional doorway because yeah. that's coming, then uh, this cruise is right. going to be absolutely fascinating. We'll be actually traversing the Bermuda Triangle from Miami to Dominican Republic, uh, Antigua, Tortola, uh, Barbados, and Dominica. Uh, and there might be one other one in St. there. St. Martin's, did Saint you Mar say? St. Martin, yeah. And St. Kitts. And St. Kitts, thank you, those areas. Um, so um, it will be quite fascinating, actually. Um, We're also going to be swimming with dolphins. Swimming with dolphins and stingrays. Now this is interesting, tell uh, them why stingrays. Because the stingray has a reptilian energy opposite of the mammalian dolphins. So by swimming with the dolphins and the stingrays in this environment, we will actually be balancing our energies, the reptilian and mammalian sides of ourselves, just by being in that physical energy. So it has some really fascinating things. We do, we will be giving a seminar on board. We will, it's an interactive. As we go and traverse the various activities, as we're on the water, as we're moving through the Bermuda Triangle, we are going to be working actively on opening up any memories, any lifelines that you need now to help you now in your life because it's amazing what you can pull forward to explain what's going on, to understand what your blocks are, to move past those blocks, to motivate you, to help you understand the world at large and how you can be a part of it, but not getting sucked into it. So a lot of things, we're going to be releasing mind control patterns installing positive mind control. A lot of work is going to happen. It's a long yeah. trip and something else very exciting is going to happen because on November 5th it's Stuart's she birthday. Stuart's birthday. So we're going to be celebrating his birthday as well on board. So lots of excitement, It'll lots of new things. Yeah, a surprise. <laughs> that's what he wants is a surprise. I, I forgot know. it was my birthday. Yeah. So anyway, so that's coming up. So we have our conference, which is great, in just a couple of weeks. We have people coming from all over the world. It's your opportunity to connect with other Expansions.com readers. If you want to connect with Stuart and I on a more personal basis, as well as other people, the cruise is going to be fascinating. Every single journey we take, we never really know until we're there because it's in the making. It's happening now. And remember that this is a very critical time. Not only is it the end times, it's the beginning of the staged alien invasion, and it is also the uh, energy of the Kuiper Belt coming through. So, um, in fact, I just read somewhere um, that uh, there's energy from Jupiter that's affecting the LNN comet, which is breaking apart. So we'll be exploring some of that during the October conference as well. Yeah. At the skies, as well as the land, the water, the sea, what's underneath, the dolphins, the stingrays, and we have one day of just lazing on a beach. But it's amazing what you can pick up while you're laying on a beach and snorkeling in the water. So it is really going to be a fascinating, in-depth look at various parts of yourself in a way that you have never explored before. And that's what we do when we journey. We have lots of depths to us, and we know it, and we're going to go into those depths. Positive, negative, neutral, whatever it is, we are finding out about ourselves, and we give you this opportunity to find out about yourself right along with us in a very up-close and personal way. So if you're interested, those of you who want to come along, contact Patricia events at expansions.com. She has all the details. She will help make your dreams come true because cruising Atlantis is going to be something we will not be repeating. Right. This is one time, one time only. Come with us if you want it, to join us. Okay. So I think that's all we have for For this today. Podcast. We've been busy working on the October yeah. seminar that's coming up. So And many other surprises for the website, so stay tuned and, right. and, and watch. I have a lot of different things that will be put on there. So until next time. This is Stuart A. Swordlow and Janet Diane Moria Swordlow for Expansions.com. Bye for now.